The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast. Hard times come again no more, but weariness not alleviated. Mass market sorrows, strands, and organic bands. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We have part two of a two-part interview with Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis discussing their new Ring of Fire novel, 1635, A Parcel of Rogues. This one takes place in England and is all about Oliver Cromwell. He's the central historical character in the book, and he turns out not to be such a Puritan of a Puritan, after all. Eric is his usual articulate, erudite, uh, entertaining storyteller self, and Andrew Dennis is a font of cool English history, so this one turned out really nice. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. And now the news. Mass market, mass market, O oh ye staple of the ancient drugstore rack. Adorner of the inviting airport alcove, promise maker, and sometime promise keeper of the bookstore shelf, and also first mover and foundation of all that is online retailing. O oh, ye conveyor of promise with your shiny cover and very arresting back cover copy, which often pans out with a really good story inside. What have ye in store for us this month? Well, it's pretty good pickings, actually. We have Strands of Sorrow, the final entry in John Ringo's Black Tide Rising, science-created zombie, yes, we will run toward the zombies instead of run away from them sort of series. The whole series has been a graveyard smash, literally, and it's currently featuring as a national bestseller in paperback, actually. Also out is The Sword of Michael by Marcus Wynn. This is a kind of noir monster hunter contemporary fantasy thriller featuring a tactical instructor who is also a shaman, advised by the spirit of a Lakota chief and an old-time Brooklyn bookie. He's fighting back against some nasty magic-using antagonists. We talked with Marcus about this on a previous podcast, and it's a really weird ride of a novel and a lot of fun. Oh, and I want to mention a new anthology that is out in Omni trade paperback format. This is Worst Contact. It's edited by the redoubtable Hank Davis. This one has some great tales about when first contact between humans and aliens goes wrong or sideways in some cases. There are stories by David Drake, Paul Anderson, Sarah A. Hoyt, and there's one by me. That story is a reprint of one of mine that came out 20 years ago or so in Asimov's magazine. And I kind of, I've always had a soft spot for that story and loved it. And it's it been very infrequently reprinted. And I think it's deserving of, of another look. Um, and I think it'll entertain you. And I'm, I'm happy Hank, Hank brought it back. This story is called No Love in All of Dwindaloo, by the way. Uh, but get the whole book. It's got some great stuff in it. Worst Contact, Strands of Sorrow by John Ringo, The Sword of Michael by Marcus Wynn, and Worst Contact, edited by Hank Davis. They are all now available at booksellers everywhere. This is part two of a two-part interview with Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis discussing 1635, A Parcel of Rogues. Part one of the interview is available in the podcast preceding this one. I want to welcome Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hi. Hello. Eric Flint is a modern master of alternate history fiction with over three million books in print. He's the creator of the New York Times bestselling Ring of Fire series. 
He's the author of many excellent short stories and novellas, including a really good one in the upcoming mass market publication uh, Tooth and Claw that will be out this spring, which is this themed alternate Paleolithic anthology that Jody Lynn Nye and, and some others are also in. Uh, with David Drake, Eric has written six popular novels in the Belisarius alternate Byzantine history series. And with David Weber, collaborated on 1633 and 1634, the Baltic War, which we may discuss, and Honorverse entries in the Crown of Slaves uh, subseries. He's the co-author of many other novels and series with writers such as David Freer, Reiki Spore, Charles Gannon, Katie Wentworth, and the list just goes on and on. Andrew Dennis is the co-author with Eric Flint of New York Times bestseller, 1634, The Galileo Affair, one of my favorites in the Ring of Fire series. He has stories in the Ring of Fire anthologies and has had many nonfiction pieces published on the subject of law and the paranormal. Andrew is a retired lawyer. He lives in Preston, England. Uh, out now at booksellers everywhere is a new Ring of Fire series entry, 1635, A Parcel of Robes, by Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis. Uh, for those who don't know, the Ring of Fire series is about a modern-day West Virginia town that gets thrown back into the middle of Europe in 1632, and it all starts in Eric's novel, 1632. The series and anthologies that 1632 have spawned are like the stars. One of the other things that I, I thought was great was the fact that people had not traveled beyond, like, the next village. So they could tell you what the next village was, but they hadn't really been to the one after that. <laughs> that, that, that was, that was um, quite standard until very, very recently. Um, uh, you know, the, there were um, guys fighting in the First World War where the, the, the trip to France was, well, the trip to, the, to, the, um, to, to basic training was the longest journey they had taken in their entire lives. Um, you know, it was the first, the first sort of mass conscription in this country. It was the first really big shift for a lot of people out of, out of their hometowns. Um, that, I mean, you know, there, there'd been some improvement in that over the course of the 19th century with industrialization and urbanization, but still people did not travel a long way. It was a big deal. Um, to, to, to get out of the neighborhood you were born in. Um, uh, so, and and that that's common to a lot of a lot of the world. Um, uh, the the you know until relatively historically recently, people were just not that mobile. Um, I mean that you know there's, there's probably parts of the world to this day where people haven't. You can haven't... find a, a bit of that in some parts of the United States. You go in parts of uh, some parts of southern West Virginia, especially eastern Kentucky. Uh, you will find people who have never left their counties. Uh, I mean, they, they'll, they'll, because they have automobiles, they'll have gone, you know, it's not, it, it's a little further than the next town. But I've known people who, um, there's a couple of coal miners who came to visit my wife and I in Morgantown were living there because we were helping organize. So they were on strike. In fact, they're actually, the strike was the Stern strike. I named the hero Mike Stern's after. Um, but they showed up, my wife and I were involved with some other people in organizing uh, labor. They came and stayed, they came and stayed uh, with us, and they had never left their county before. Uh, so you can find it, but even there, it's not the next village. I mean, people know how to drive, so, you know, but, but I, I have known people who have never left their county. Eric um, used to be a uh, union organizer before he became the a best-selling writer, by the way, for those that don't know. Anyway, uh, that, uh, <laughs> but I just thought it was absolutely terrific. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it takes them forever just to go what is, in fact, a short distance. And, and part of the whole novel, this, like I said, this is the part that Andrew wrote entirely, is just this kind of, it's almost comical, this chase between the people chasing after him and them, and it's like everybody's lost. Um, and it's taking them weeks to, to travel what is, in fact, geographically a very short distance, but that's sort of the reality of it before they finally yeah. make their way up to the Scotland. Yeah. I mean, they're not helped any by the fact that they're doing this in early summer when, you know, the, the undergrowth in that part of the world goes from knee high to, to, 
twice the height of a man in about two weeks. Um, it's, I mean, there's a reason it's some of the most fertile country in northwestern Europe uh, to this day. It, it, you just, you know, short of dropping a plane load of Agent Orange on it, you are just not going to see where you're going. And of course, they are, they are, you know, uh, doing escape and evasion maneuvers at the time as well, which doesn't help. Well, speaking of their being chased, um, the on the the bad guy side or the or the somewhat bad guy side, um, we have a, we have two groups we're following. Um, we have King Charles. Uh, he's not exactly well beloved even by his own advisors, right? <laughs> oh, he was the man was a royal pain in the ass. To <laughs> Literally. I mean, uh, well, no, I mean it's it's just. Um, the way we depict him in the novels is, I think, quite true to life. I mean, he was just, he wasn't just simply he was incompetent, which he was, but he was annoying to deal with. I mean, he would just be fussy and pissy over little things, and then, you know, they knew him. Uh, but, yeah, uh, his advisors had a hard time dealing with him. Um, yeah. I mean, especially the advisors we actually have uh, advising him in the books. Uh, I mean, um, British history has famously been described as 2,000 years of upper-class idiots in charge. Um, and, you know, Charles Stewart is practically the type specimen for that. Uh, but uh, on the other, on the other, you know, the, the two advisors we give him uh, during the course of the books are, um, you know, uh, the Earl of Strafford, Thomas Wentworth, who's, you know, your, your classic hard-nosed Yorkshireman. Um, and uh, and then there's uh, Boyle, the, the first Earl of Cork, um, who's well. I mean, you know, the Essex Wide Boy is actually a with with an eye to the main chance is actually still a comic stereotype to this day in England. Uh, and he was the first colonial millionaire, very much a self-made man. Um, went over to um, into the sort of chaos of uh, um, of uh, an island that was only only just under the English crown. Um, uh, and, and bought and married into and built himself, um, a, a, a remarkable base of, of wealth and power, uh, on the southern coast of Ireland there in County Cork. Um, uh, and, and you know, it clearly, clearly a, a very, a very bright, very driven man. Um, uh, and, and, and he's having to deal with this upper class twit who, who, who thinks he's entitled by the grace of God to, to have things done his way and no other. Um, well, Boyle uh, is, uh, <laughs> Boyle is historic, right? He's, he's, he was a real Absolutely. Dude. Yeah. Th those, those, those of you heard of Boyle's law in relation to gases, um, the, the, the Boyle in the books is actually his dad. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the famous early physicist was, I, I think his third or fourth son. Um, uh, he, I mean, he had, a, he had a large family. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, a, a very, a very real individual, um, who, who, as I say, jumped feet first into the absolute chaos of early 17th, late 16th and early 17th century Ireland. And, and made himself very, very rich doing it. I mean, the, you know, later on, you'd get, um, the same sort of chap doing that kind of thing in Africa. And you'd, 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 you'd have the, the likes of, uh, of, of, um, um, I forget his first name, Rhodes, uh, after whom Rhodesia was named. Cecil um, Rhodes, yeah. Yeah, Cecil Rhodes. That's the, that's the chap. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, the, the early East India Company guys, um, we're doing the same sort of thing, and you have this this sort of breed of new men, early early capitalists, um, uh, who, who were going out and and making themselves into millionaires in the colonies from very very uh, very very small beginnings. Um, uh, I mean, none of them what you'd call nice men. None of them, none of them, they'd be polite, sure, but you you wouldn't want them nicking your country. <laughs> Uh, but they, they were all certainly very effective uh, individuals. Um, we also and, have. Um, they send out a uh, a really uh, a really great sort of uh, thuggish Irishman. Um, who is uh, he's 
he he's he's based on a historical he he isn't so much the thug he's he's the guy leading the band of thugs uh but i mean there's there's this long traditional tradition of guerrilla warfare uh in ireland um you know which was already centuries old by the the mid 17th century um uh you know if you, if you look it up on the terms like rapery um and and the guys who who did that uh you know basically cattle thieves turned to political warfare um were um uh, in irish they were called tory uh usually pursuers uh, from which we get the modern word for the conservative party in england so yeah i mean um <laughs> the word tory actually does mean thief um sorry a little bit of politics there uh, <laughs> uh but um that is absolutely where the name came from. Yes, um, during the late 17th century, the the, the royalist supporters were damned by a association with the um, with the early Irish rebels who who claimed they were fighting for king's rights, which um, was was about as, as about as threadbare a fig leaf as states' rights would be a couple of hundred years later, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 so the, the royalist supporters got called Tories. Um, to sort of damn them by association with the with the assorted uh, cattle thieves of uh, of rural Ireland who turned to guerrilla warfare, which is a very very old tradition. I mean, one of the uh, you know sort of uh, defining early myths of the Irish people is actually called the cattle raid of Cooley. It was it was gigantic armed robbery, um, uh, which is you know a really old fashioned epic poetry. Um, yeah, which which my grandmother could could quote great chunks of, um, at, uh, if if you really persuaded her hard, um, and so you've you've got those guys, and then you also have um, after the sort of chaos of the early seventeenth century, you have a lot of um, Irish gentry uh, who were basically um, dispossessed entirely. Um, so you you've got a lot of broken men. So individuals with virtually no economic stake in the in the nation they lived in but they had the education and and the and the and the awareness that life could be better than um than you know hard scrabble farming and and listening to granddad whine about how he was dispossessed so the likes of the earl of cork who a notoriously ruthless individual is going to need a few leg breakers and enforcers, um, and and that's that's who Finnegan is, and he gets put in charge of a band of a band of cattle thieves, uh, and when something needs doing, that that perhaps, well, I mean the, the kind you know it, it's a band of the kind of individuals who a couple of hundred years later would uh, um, evict. Uh, tenant farmers by setting fire to the roof of their their houses um uh, which which was you know standard procedure around the time of the famine i think you um, have um, don't you have somebody throw a, a pot that explodes into somebody's house in the book or uh, the, the, the the old the old fashioned grenade oh, because, uh, yeah there's uh, there, that that's that's referenced as a, as an incident in the past of this particular particular gang of cutthroats yeah. that Rather than you know just setting fire to it, one of them thought it would be funny to to throw a grenade in. Um, it's just the kind you know, of thing we, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in in any sort of wild, uh, wild and um, you know somewhat lawless area, you are going to get individuals who have the brakes off. Um, uh, you, uh, there's, there are parallels to be drawn with the kind of individuals who became famous in the uh, you know in the wild west, and you know the. Um, pe I mean, you know, the difference between Finnegan and uh, and you know William Bonney is not large. <laughs> the, that kind of individual, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's it, you can easily write Billy the Kid as a villain or a hero, um, well, you know. And it, if if Finnegan had been around uh, sort of six or seven years later during the rebellion, he could well have been. I mean, it could well have been one of the one of the guerrillas in the mountains of Wicklow, um, you know. And 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 in that context, yeah, he's a freedom fighter and a hero. In this context, he's uh, he's a leg breaker for for the local big guy. Um, so, well, he's a great I mean, he's a great character um, yeah. in the book, and he's um, 
it, it, just the the fact that he he keeps getting stymied by the ignorance of the population is pretty funny <laughs> as well. Well, I mean, there's there's a certain there's a certain amount of um, uh, you know, I mean, well, they're hiding Cromwell it, as well, yes. Well, they are they are hiding Cromwell, and there, there, there would be a certain amount of prejudice as well. I mean, it's within living memory that you used to see signs up saying "No dogs, blacks, or Irish." <laughs> um, and and that is a very old prejudice in in uh, in these parts. Um, you know, it, I mean, Eric, Eric found it kind of amusing when I when I started trotting out some of the local prejudices hereabouts. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there's, I, I think it was George Bernard Shaw commented that it's impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without at least some other Englishman despising him. Um, and it goes over the whole of the British Isles. I mean, we every every you know. Everyone's got ethnicity of choice jokes about people from the next town over, uh, but but the prejudice against Irish folk is very very real, very very old. Um, especially especially during the sort of period when you know the cry of no popery would raise a riot, because obviously they they were the the big holdout for um, the Catholic Church in in the British Isles. Yeah. Well, we also have Scotland um, in the mix here in a parcel of rogues. Um, what is the political situation? And we got Scottish characters that we that we're with, part of the book. Uh, what's the political situation there? How does it intersect <laughs> what our characters are up to? Not not to get too deeply into it, perhaps. Again, we're we're up to this. Do you want this in the twelve hours version? Um, bluntly put, um, during the sixteenth century, um, there were a, a, a couple of documents signed by all of the notables of Scotland, the National Covenant. Which, as I say, you can summarise with with the words "near property," um, uh, and and then James the first, um, who, while not quite as big a royal idiot as his son, was still a fairly major idiot, um, decides that uh, he's going to enforce the divine right of kings by imposing uh, bishops on a staunchly Presbyterian uh, church establishment. Um, which they didn't want, but you know, James the first was knee bishop, knee king. Um, uh, so you, you already have most of the major um, uh, landowners, the likes of Montrose, the likes of Campbell, are already annoyed at the Stuart dynasty um, for uh, uh, attempting to, you know, lead them back to the errors of Rome, which which is exactly how the National Covenant describes it. But they need uh, they need Argyle and and Montrose is on is on Charles's side in the book, right? Um, yes, historically he 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 was uh, on the Covenant side in the in the Bishops' War, which was which was the opening shots of the the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, and then realised that well, or decided that um, the interests of Scotland would be better served by at least maintaining the monarchy. So. He stayed on the uh, on the royalist side for the rest of the wars, um, and, and became, is known to this day as the Great Montrose because um, uh, certainly uh, by the somewhat amateurish standards of of, of those wars, because you know the very very little of the wars of religion in Europe had actually made it across the Channel, uh, but he, he was certainly tactically better than. Uh, pretty much everyone else he faced, uh, but still lost because, you know, he was working for Charles Stewart. So <laughs> everything, everything he's trying to achieve in terms of winning the war is being undermined by the idiot back at head office. Um, uh, I mean, one of the other in entertaining things, uh, about Montrose is because he has, he has, uh, like Campbell, he has a significant force of Highlanders and the Montrose Highlanders, uh, were the last people to actually use the longbow in war. Um, uh, towards the end there when things were getting a bit dicey for the royalist side. Um, so come the end of the, uh, the wars of the three kingdoms and parliament, uh, the parliamentary side finally winning, he, he gets executed as the sort of, um, uh, along with Charles the first, um, and ends with his head on the, the highest prick of the toll booth. Um, uh, 
which obviously the big, which is the, the big prison in the middle of Edinburgh. Um, and uh, if you were beheaded for treason, they, they, they stuck your head on the, on one of the spikes on the roof. Um, uh, amusingly then Campbell, who was the biggest landowner in, uh, Campbell's the biggest clan in Scotland, um, the Earl of Argyle, uh, but he's, he's the head of the clan Campbell. Um, and he was more or less, uh, king of Scotland throughout the, throughout the period of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms because, uh, you know, royal power was uh, sort of desperately fighting to, to stay in the game in Scotland. Um, come 1661 and the restoration of the monarchy, um, all of the evidence that he'd coll- collaborated with Cromwell came out, and he was executed too, and they put his head up next to Montrose's. Um, so, I mean, Montrose and, Montrose and, uh, and, and our Isle, um, whose actual surnames were, were Graham and Campbell, uh, were, were the two big men in Scots politics outside the Stuart dynasty. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to write a book set in 17th century Scotland, you have to have those two guys in it. It would be like writing a book about the, the English Civil War without putting Cromwell in, um, and, you know, or <laughs> leaving out Charles Stuart. That they were the two, the two big guys in, in, in that conflict. This wasn't quite, it doesn't sound very enlightened in Edinburgh to put people's heads on posts, but I guess it, the, that was the, <laughs> a new they, era they, coming they, up later. They, they believed in being tough on crime in those days. Um, you know, for, my, for minor offenses, they chained you up by the neck to the prison wall so that people could throw refuse at you. Um, it, there, there are still a lot of municipal buildings in, in Scotland that still have those chains and, and, uh, and um, and uh, collars attached to them. Uh, the, the Scots word for them is jugs. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. I've never heard. Uh, I've never actually heard it pronounced out loud. But yeah, that 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 was a that was a standard thing. Um, you know, and you know, if if, if they really misbehaved, then they, they they could be burnt at the stake or you know hung, drawn, and quartered. It was, as I say, they 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 they, they, they there's. They, they certainly believed in making sure that the punishment for the first offence precluded the possibility of a second one, uh-huh. um, as uh, Terry Patchett put it. Yeah. A uh, a parcel of rogues is a line from I think a Robert Burns poem. Um, perhaps he's getting it from an old, even older uh, source. Um, and you quote bits of this uh, throughout as epigrams of the book. Can you tell us what the, that is and, and where it came from? Um, it's actually uh, from nearly a century later. Um, now, the period in the book, um, there's you, you have one monarch wearing two crowns and two separate parliaments. Um, um, towards the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century, um, the, the English parliament, the English government, uh, essentially started in with a hostile, ta- what we'd now call a hostile takeover bid. Um, you know, there were, there were punitive acts, uh, passed against Scots' interests in England, um, which, which would have done very little, but, um, most of the Scots nobility invested in, in the Darien scheme, as that's Darien, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the one, uh, in Central America there, the, um, um, the, the idea being was that they would have an overland route, um, Doing the job that the Panama Canal does nowadays, um, and uh, and they invested very heavily in this. I mean, estimates of the amount of Scots currency that went that got sunk into this scheme vary from uh, a quarter of all the money they had up to half, um, depending on which source you look at. Um, and um, it it basically lost pretty much the entire wealth of lowland Scotland, which was most of the wealth of Scotland at the time, because uh, the Highlanders were, you know, um, as, as, as a, when, you know, without giving any spoilers, a number of characters remark on that the Highlanders are a bunch of illiterate papist savages who basically have, have their cattle and not a lot else. Uh, so most of the wealth of uh, most of the wealth of Scotland at that time sunk into this scheme. Um, they they didn't plan for really any of the difficulties they would face uh, from malaria on up to the rather angry response of the, of the Spanish Empire. Wasn't that uh, was that called New Hibernia or something like that? Was um, the colony? That, anyway. It, 
It, it might well have been. Um, I, I, I tended, I, I, I studied it more from the economic effects in the British Isles. So the, the reason that the Scots Parliament passed uh, the Act of Union uh, of, if memory serves, 1706, might be 1707, was they basically got bribed by, um, by the British government. Um, but the reason those bribes were accepted was they needed the money because Scotland was absolutely flat, stony broke. They'd lost everything. Um, and so you get um, uh, an irate little poet from Ayrshire, Robbie Burns, who, who um, you know, is, is absolutely disgusted with this. Um, one, I mean, one of uh, the English spies of the time, a chap called Daniel Defoe, whose uh, who's work you may be familiar with, um, was uh, was spying for the English government in uh, in Scotland at the time, and he he said, you know, for for every one you find in support of union, there's ninety nine against. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely, everyone was disgusted that 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 their entire political class had just basically been bought out, um, and and so uh, Robbie Burns wrote a wrote a poem, you know, treason thus could sell us. Uh, were bought and sold for English gold. He, he, that, that, that was the level of disgust um, that, uh, you know, a, a poet largely famous for, you know, homely verses about haggis and mice um, suddenly starts writing strident political polemic. That's that's how annoyed everyone was. And, yeah, the, the sentiment, uh, well, the, the wording of the sentiment is, uh, is, is original to Robbie Burns, even though, Absolute disgust that the ruling class goes back, probably to you know for dynasty Egypt. Um, uh, is it? So yeah, that, I mean, and we borrowed that um, simply riffing off something uh, Eric did um, when uh, he first had Daryl McCarthy sounding off about um, sounding off about Cromwell um, uh, and ranting on about you know what a parcel of rogues, thinking it was about Ireland. And, uh, and and gets corrected by his somewhat forthright history t former history teacher pointing out that was actually about Scotland. Uh, that there is a reason um, a lot of a lot of the more romantically inclined Irish nationalists think it's about, uh, or, or, or rather tend to associate it with <laughs> Ireland, um, is that the Dubliners recorded a really good version of it. <laughs> Uh, that's actually the, the one. Yeah, I know. That's actually the one I'm more familiar with. The the poem yeah. set to song. You mean? Yeah. 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 It's um, uh, and and, and uh, you know, uh, and, and you know, I recommend it to anyone that's listening to this podcast. Podcast that I mean, the Dubliners you know did uh very did, really did a lot to um. We, for Irish folk music, but on that particular occasion, it was a Scots poem. <laughs> uh, well, it's a it's a wonderful title for the book, I think. Um, again, yeah, maybe one of my favorite Ring of Fire titles that that y'all have come up with. Um, so, uh, just a, a meta question about the series, Eric. Um, are you working on the Ottoman Empire now? Is that because I yeah. know it's scheduled? Well, I'm for... about yeah. I mean, I'm. I haven't started writing yet, but I'm about to. <laughs> Is that going to be the um, next uh, Ring of Fire novel? That'll be the next novel, yeah. The next book coming out is in May, and it's Ring of Fire 4. Uh, and I have a short novel in that called Scarface that uh, continues the adventures of Harry Leopard. Um, and then the next book coming out is my novel, which is 1636, The Ottoman Onslaught, and that's coming out. In January, not this January, but a year from January, um, January twenty seventh. It's going to be the Ottoman and then onslaught. After that, I'm, huh? It's going to be called the Ottoman onslaught. The Ottoman onslaught. Okay, yeah. I uh, better fix that in the database. <laughs> yeah, Let's write uh, that down. And here. obviously, the title is something of a spoiler, but anyone who's been following the series and hasn't figured out by now that the Ottoman Empire is about to attack is. Uh, well, I, I, you could figure it out just from history alone. I mean, the, the, the current sultan of the Ottoman Empire is known to history as Murad the Maniac. <laughs> he was, it's interesting because he was a, uh, he was actually a, the most competent, uh, uh, sultan in a hundred years. Uh, he, he was just, um, 
I have been told, by the way, by someone who's an expert on Ottoman history that that that, <laughs> that he was not actually called that, but um, but he could have been. Uh, he, but a lot of his um, ruthlessness and sort of bloodthirstiness seems to have been done for. Uh, uh, some of it seems to have been an act. I mean, not that he wasn't capable of it, but a lot of it would have been to uh, encourage his advisors. Let's start that way. Um, but he's, uh, and he's young. He's in his 20s. Um, so he's actually about the same age as Alexander the Great. Um, and he's very competent. It's uh, it's always nice to have competent villains in writing books like this. Um it's actually the reason in 1634 the Baltic War that I had the Earl of York wind up taking over because he was capable. Um, and for a variety of reasons, I need to get Wentworth that other picture. Um, so in any event, that will be the next novel. And then I'm not quite sure after that. There's, uh, um, there are two possibilities that would come up next, and I'm not sure which of them will be yet, but there will be at least one more novel in 2017, quite possibly two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we've actually turned in uh, three manuscripts in this series um, that are holding fire for various reasons. Four, actually. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not going to have any shortage of material. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so Andrew, are you uh, involved in any more collaborative projects? Uh, with Eric or elsewhere? Uh, well, we've um, we've started work on the outline for the for the next book in Cromwell's well, Cromwell and Daryl's adventures. Um, uh, and obviously, I need to you know um, uh, refine the details as to as to where things go there. Um, I mean, to a certain extent. Um, uh, you know, I, I ended uh, the parcel of rogues in such a way that I could actually use a lot of uh, sort of local history knowledge of my own um, for, for the opening stages of the next book. Uh, but it's it's where it goes after that. Um, uh, well, there, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and as I say, obviously, um, we're um, <laughs> it's. Uh, Attempting to mesh together, you know, what, what we can historically get away with, with, uh, where Eric wants the story to go, <laughs> which is, uh, which is, which is a challenge of what make, makes writing these books so, so much fun, really. <laughs> See, what's gonna, we're working up the plot for the sequel and it's, it's, it's tricky. Part of it is obviously continuing with what happened to us with Cromwell and, and, um, and Dale and, and, uh, and Daryl and Vicky, who are the ones who are staying, um, and Stephen and Hamilton. Um, Julie Sims and Alex McKay have, have left by the end of the book. Um, but there are other factors involved, one of which you don't even know about yet, Andrew, because I just dawned on me, I have not sent you a copy of the short novel I just wrote. Um, <laughs> because I, I think actually you and I are going to wind up including the sequel to that short novel as one of the subplots in our next book. Uh, so, because it's Harry Leppert's next adventure is, is, uh, uh, he's been basically hired by the king, by Gustav Adolf to find out who really killed his wife. And, and Balder Nordahl is, is in with him and suspicion is now focused very tightly on the Crazed Huguenots, whom you and I first introduced in Galileo there, so, ah, yeah. and who are now residing in Scotland. So, um, I, I, <laughs> I totally forgot. I will email you that that short novel as soon as I get <laughs> off the phone because you need to look at it. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> I actually think we're going to need to use part of our next novel to be the sequel to that story. Yeah. Thing. Writers we'll plotting, writers plotting their book on the podcast. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's there a will huge also project. Probably... It's the kind of thing that happens. Sorry. Yeah, that's on. how a lot of this series has worked out. It's there. It's a bowl of spaghetti, and uh, uh, it, it, the collaborative nature of it is, it is is quite real. I mean, it's not just the formality you put on the title page. 
it, the way a series actually unfolds. Uh, but anyway, Andrew, I will email you that story. You do need to look at it. Well, you know, as soon as you get a chance. But I yeah. think we're going to have to um, fit, figure it on including some of that in there next week. Excellent. Look forward to it. Well, the book we're talking about now is 1635, A Parcel of Rogues by Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis. It's available at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Eric and Andrew, thank you very much for being with us. You're very much welcome. All right. And I will talk to you later. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 21 I think the lodge needs to be a harbor queen for now, Steve said over the radio. It drinks fuel. We don't have that many people that we need a boat this size. And it's a bitch to actually use. If we did use it, I'd see it as an at-sea base. If we can find enough fuel for it. Cooper here, Chris said over the radio. I can see that, but what about theft? Just about out of fuel, Mike said. We'll drain it down, and it's not going anywhere. Leave it alongside the Victoria. We might have a use for it later. It runs, anyway. This is Endeavor. We're getting beat up in this minnow. Could use a bigger boat. Stephen Blair, the sole survivor of the 35-foot Viking Worthy Endeavor, had had issues from the beginning. But he'd also cleared more than 40 rafts and lifeboats since taking over the battered ship. Endeavor? Seawolf, Sophia said. You do not want to con this thing alongside a raft. Concur, da. This is a support ship. Better in harbor for now. Endeavor. He thought for a second about the growing fleet. See fit. You were both next up for a bigger vessel. We'll determine that when available. But this is a monster. Any likely candidates? Endeavor. We just relayed another. About 65. Wouldn't mind if it's usable. Do we have a location on that? Steve asked. Yeah, Mike said. Back at the Vicky. I've got it on the toy, Sophia said. My recommendation, Steve said, use this for harbor base. Staff with reliable personnel, bring in new personnel for rest and recovery prior to assignment. Comments and response for vote? See fit? I'm fine on my boat for now, Captain Sherrill replied. George Sherrill, sole survivor on the 35-foot Bertram, was less than enthusiastic about ever seeing another zombie in his life, possibly because the entire charter he'd had had zombied on him. And yeah, that sounds like a plan. Endeavor? We need a bigger boat, Blair replied. But agree. Not? I'd go for a bigger boat, Gary Loper of the Not-So-Little replied. I guess I'm next after Blair. At the discussion, Steve said. Not saying no, just later discussion. Agree leave Lodge Harbor for rest and refit? Yeah, I can go with that but about a larger boat. The truth was that Steve didn't think that Loper and his crew deserved a larger boat. They just seemed to be cruising around and coming in from time to time to draw on supplies. Captain's vote for next upgrade, Steve said. Cannot nominate self. He thought about it for a second and tried not to grimace. He knew he was playing politics. By the real rules, Blair should be the first to nominate. But if he nominated Loper, which was the only real choice... Others might follow. But Cheryl not only liked his boat, small as it was, but liked Blair. See fit? Blair from the Endeavor, Cheryl replied instantly. Endeavor? Seawolf, Blair replied. Seriously? 
Sophia asked. Not so large? Uh, sea wolf. Damn, Sophia muttered. Daniel Cooper. Blair. That bastard, Sophia said. Victoria? Blair, Mike said into the radio. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Sophia said. You don't get it, do you? Mike said, grinning. You're going to get the endeavor. Oh, Sophia said, then grimaced. It really is small. It's a good learning boat, Steve said. Tina's toy abstains. Any votes against Captain Blair for the next upgrade? The eyes have it. Next good boat goes to Captain Blair and his chosen crew. Any old business we really need to cover? Because I'm going to have to head out to that 65. Commodore Cooper, Chris said. We're in position and have clearance team Bravo. We'll vector to clear. Roger Cooper, Steve said, trying not to let the surprise enter his voice. He'd started to forget he didn't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all, Com, Chris said. Any other business? Steve asked. We'd like a bigger boat as soon as possible, Loper said. We'll discuss that when the question comes up, Steve said. Anything else? He looked over as Mike raised his hand. Victoria? We're burning an awful lot of diesel, Mike said over the radio. I mean, try to refuel from derelicts if you can, or tow them in here and we'll get it out. But we're going through diesel like crazy. Keep an eye out for small tankers, Steve said. Anything else critical? Can we get some of that vaccine? Loper called. Some of my crew are asking. The radio tech leaned forward, clamping his earphones to his ears. What? Petty Officer Second Class Stan Bundy asked, picking up his own set. The Los Angeles class attack boat SSN 900, USS Dallas, had been tracking the formation of this at sea militia, as it had been classified, for the last three weeks, ever since radio communication between multiple boats between Bermuda and the U.S. had been detected. Vaccine, electronics mate Harry Ferdet whispered. Son of a bitch, Steve swore, then keyed the radio. Okay, not. First of all, thanks for bringing any pirates that may still exist down on us. Like we covered, that is not for discussion over the radio. But since we're discussing something... No, the supply is limited, and it's only for clearance personnel. You want some? Do some clearing. Or even maybe pick up some survivors. Upload this for priority exam, Bundy said, hitting a key and backing up the recording. Hey, we're busting our ass out here in this dinky little boat, and we don't need your shit, Commodore. We've been clearing these damned lifeboats. There's nobody home. Loper, you're full of shit, Blair called. We've cleared 20 lifeboats in the last couple of days. And yeah, there's not much, but we've picked up six people. On our even dinkier boat. Clear the channels, Steve said, as the channel got cluttered with people screaming at each other. Clear the... Ah, oh, shit. Christ, I want to cut in. Commander Rex Bradburn was frustrated, angry, and scared, which described his entire crew. They'd started to sea before the plague was spread and had remained at sea since, because to make contact meant dying, like their families on shore. But a sub could only stay at sea for so long. Sure, the pile would last 20 years, more if you only used low power. But all the other systems? Not to mention food. They had gone on short rations as soon as they found out they were on extended deployment. That only lasted so long, and that went for all the surviving boats. Some of them had already dropped off the screen, just lost. Possibly mutinied, but more likely something vital broke at the wrong time, or the wrong depth. Others had snuck into deserted harbors and put their crews ashore to survive as best they could. But if they had vaccine... Monitor only, sir, Lieutenant Commander Joseph Schultz reminded him. Not so little, Steve said as the shouting died down. We still don't have a protocol for this, but I think that a captain's vote would be sufficient. If you don't start showing that you're working the problem, 
I see no reason for you to get diesel or fuel. You can put some welly in it, or turn over your boat and join the lost and useless, or try to make it without clearance teams. Just because you got all the guns doesn't make you God, Commodore. You've got guns, Steve replied. I gave you two pistols for light clearance, which as far as I can tell, you haven't used. And yes, I'll take those back as well. So it's up to you and your crew. You're either in or out. You want to take off? We'll accept the pistols back. Fill your boat and you can take off. But that's it. Or you can work the problem. Or you can turn over your boat. Or hell, you can take off right now and I'll spot you the pistols. What you cannot do is continue to draw on supplies while not contributing. So I'm giving you two weeks. Start working the EPIRBs instead of hanging out on the back side of the island and playing Bermuda vacation. Or no more supplies. Do I make myself clear? I hear you. To all, make this clear. Steve said. Make it clear to the people you pull in. You're either working to help, somehow, or you're not. If you're not, you get to go hang out on a sort of beat-up boat with a lot of other useless people. We'll feed you, that's it. How you get along otherwise is up to you. If, like the not, you've got a boat, you can go away. But we're not going to supply people with diesel and other support who are not working the problem. You know there are fucking zombies on these boats, right? A voice screamed. No shit, Sherlock. Steve leaned back as the voices overlapped. Commodore, this is the knot. We'll take the supplies. We're done with your shit. Roger, Steve said. Come into harbor. One fuel load and one ton of supplies. Victoria's choice. If you come back for more, you trade your boat and join the lost and useless. The captain's conference is now closed. He leaned back and shook his head. That could have gone better, Steve said. He picked a bunch of losers just like him, Mike said. I think you were right the first way around. Just because they're on board doesn't mean they get the boat. I mean, he said, looking around. Your boat, Mike, Steve said, grinning. Nobody has an issue with that. Hell, if you want to doss on the lodge, nobody's going to have an issue. I don't think. You going to have problems with the knot? I don't think so, Mike said, shrugging. Can I have one of those shotguns? How about an AK, Steve said. They're about useless for clearing, and people are afraid of them. That'll work, Mike said. I don't see them getting uppity with an AK staring them in the face. How well do you trust your crew? Steve asked. Fine, Mike said. It's like training cats, but they're learning. I mean, the basics. I wouldn't trust them running this at sea, but until we can find a main transfer coil for it, it's not going anywhere. I'll leave you two AKs, Steve said. Have the supplies ready to load. Don't let them board. And if they have an issue with that, you've got the AKs. Make sure there's no fuel in this one either. I'll do better than that, Mike said. I'll pull the mains breaker. Do we have any idea where they got vaccine? Frank Galloway was the National Constitutional Continuity Coordinator. Prior to that, he had been Under Deputy Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Arms Proliferation Control. The post of National Constitutional Continuity Coordinator had been created in 1947, after it became obvious that the entire upper echelon of government could be taken out by one atomic bomb. There was a chain of civilian control that went deep. This was not the presidential succession defined in the Constitution, but a guarantee of continued civilian control of the military in the event of global nuclear war, or, say, laughably, a zombie plague. The NCCC's job was to keep things in some reasonable order, or restore order, so that there could be an election again. Right now, he was stuck 60 feet underground in Omaha, Nebraska, surrounded by zombies. Shortly after 9-11, the various departments that the NCCC succession went through had taken to quietly rotating people into secure points around the U.S. Not only the DOD had such facilities, they had become a bit of a cachet in the inner circles of government. You weren't seriously important unless you had a secure facility. During the Cold War, in the threat of imminent nuclear obliteration, 
Only the Department of Defense, the President, and Congress had secure facilities. By the time of the H7D3 virus, even the FDA had one. Of course, wouldn't you know, the only ones that hadn't been taken down by the virus were the Hole and CDC, which left one Frank Galloway, career DOD nuclear war specialist, as the NCCC, just ahead of the surviving senior officer of the CDC, who was also on the list. And they came after all the state governors. It didn't help that he was only 33. His Russian counterpart was nearly 70 and a former KGB nuclear security officer. No, sir, Brigadier General Shelley Bryce said. The former assistant deputy commander of strategic armaments control was one of the few female generals in the Air Force. A former B-52 driver, she had been part of the movement to recreate Strategic Air Force Command after it became clear that when the Air Force took its eyes off their nuclear weapons, bad things had happened. Notably, in 2007, an outside inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency determined that over 30 weapons were unaccounted for. The head of the Air Force Department was fired and SAC was reborn. The rebels hadn't managed to, quite, retake the high ground, but they'd at least gotten full control of the nukes as well as their storied acronym. And they'd gotten the whole. And now, well, they'd absolutely taken over the Empire. What was left of it? She'd been flag duty officer when the orders to lock down had come in. As far as she could tell, she was now the senior surviving officer in the entire United States military first female commander of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Big Cheese, admittedly of nothing but some submarines. Her Navy counterpart was a commander who was now, apparently, the CNO. Or, and this had been a low level, everybody recognized as sort of pointless discussion a boomer commander in the Pacific might be. Since he had the local guy by date of rank. Actually, six boomer commanders had him by date of rank. There was also an army colonel, who was a pretty decent sort, and damned good at poker, and a marine lieutenant colonel she suspected had been shoved off to a nothing post because nobody in the marines could understand how he made lieutenant colonel in the first place. And the fact that he used to not only be a nuclear weapons maintenance officer, but security commander for a storage facility sort of scared the shit out of her. Total flake. There were the news reports that some groups had been producing clandestine vaccine from human remains, the flake said. Lieutenant Colonel Howard Ellington twitched right after speaking, one of his habits that had Bryce right on the edge of murder. CDC, Galloway said. Comment? It was doable, Dr. Dobson said. And, quietly, it was recognized in the immunology community that some people were doing it. By that, I mean people with degrees who were in some sort of position to get the material, which, admittedly, was being an accessory to murder. Given how things ended up going, I'm not going to point fingers or condemn. It wasn't even particularly hard to do, and much, much faster than the alternatives. Frankly, if we'd just processed those who became full neurological from the beginning, we probably could have stopped this in its tracks but nobody then was willing to even consider it. In retrospect? That's a hindsight I'm not sure I want to explore, Galloway said. We might have to, sir, with respect, General Bryce said. Explain, Galloway said. If we're going to get vaccine to the uninfected crews, there aren't a lot of other choices, Bryce said. I don't see anyone being able to produce the... Dr. Dobson? What the general is saying is that the attenuated vaccine is relatively easy to make, Dobson said. Not easy, and there are dangers, but it's doable. Whereas the crystal formation serum, we've got some here, now, but it's exceedingly unlikely that they have either the ability or the equipment to build it. And from the sounds of it, killing infected does not really bother some of them. Frankly, Mr. Galloway... Getting the attenuated virus from infected Homo sapiens is the only valid choice in terms of vaccine for the crews. There's one problem I'd like to bring up, Commander Lewis Freeman said. Using an untested vaccine produced by people whose credentials we don't even know on our last remaining operational military arm raises some issues. You think? 
Galloway said, chuckling. The one of the things going for the NCCC, in Bryce's opinion, is that he had a great black sense of humor. Then there's the whole chopping off people's heads to make it, Commander. I'm cognizant of the issues, Commander, and we'll cover them if and when we get to that point. But since the agenda for the rest of the day is watching the world not miraculously spring back to its feet, I'm declaring a blue sky discussion. Dr. Dobson, you know, more or less, what is required for attenuated vaccine? Yes, sir, Dobson said. General lab equipment, a controlled source of radiation such as an x-ray machine, infected spinal cords, and a blender. I think I know where the nukes can get some radiation, Bryce said. Controlled, Dobson said. I'm not sure exactly how much you can release from a nuke's engine or how you do it, but the most important part is that it be controllable and precise. If you get too much, you do too much damage to the virus and it's useless. Too little and you infect those you're trying to vaccinate. That was one of the major mistakes the drug dealers, who were selling virus that was, in fact, attenuated, made. Some of them infected their customers. Others gave them vaccine that wasn't much more than tap water with some random organic material in it. On the other hand, some of the materials collected off the street might as well have been made here. It was that good. Controlled. There's a way to do a release, Commander Freeman said. How controlled? The radiation dosage for creating the primer is 43 millicuries per second per milliliter in a standard microtube, Dobson said. For the booster, 37 millicuries. If you're off by as much as a millicury or a tenth of a second, you get either useless or infection. That's the danger of attenuated virus. Damn, Galloway said. What would you suggest using if we, and I'm starting to think we can't, use this method? A cesium x-ray machine, Dobson said, and a lot of prayer. I'd suggest testing specific lots of the vaccine on specific crewmen, absent them having picked up a microbiologist along the way, or having someone familiar with successful attenuated vaccine production. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the blessings of the Bruce and the gyrations of the Mick and the croonings of the Frank, plus the congealed platonic form of adulation, excitement, and anticipation for the next one to Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis, authors of 1635, A Parcel of Robes. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. We keep reaching for the stars. The Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama. Presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.